ladies and gentlemen i first of all give my thanks to jamia milia it is indeed very comfortable for both my wife and me to be here and i am enjoying my visit enormously when you are asked whether there is life outside the earth extraterrestrial as it is called the answer does not depend on a single subject like astronomy or biology but a large number of different disciplines get involved uh, in the search for this answer so when i come for an answer to in my talk today uh, let me right in the beginning uh, confess that i don't have a plus or minus or yes or no type answer to the question as to whether life outside the earth exists or have we found it but i would like to give you how the search is going on and to what extent uh, we can make some predictions about future so can we go to the next slide please excuse me yeah uh, when we talk of extraterrestrial it means the universe which is spread around all in all directions around the earth and how big it is we will try to get some answer to this particular uh, question so we go in a hierarchical fashion so i would like to show you next slide uh, this we start with our earth on which we are located we basically <coughs> the solar system which the sun is partly shown on the left hand side of this picture and <coughs> you can see the what were called nine planets around the the sun uh, in on the to uh, on the right now you might wonder why did i say nine when when nowadays it is recognized that there are only eight planets and pluto is no longer allowed the membership of the uh, club of planets uh, here you see our milky way what in hindi we call akash ganga this is made up of a large number of stars distributed in a disk like fashion and the number of stars in our galaxy is approximately estimated as something like 11 zeros after one so you can see how big it is uh, 100 billion if you like to express it in some unit for a long time astronomers thought that the whole universe that we see with our telescopes uh, is actually uh, part of the milky way but there were some minority of astronomers who kept saying that there are certain other f- fuzzy looking objects which you see on the photograph and these uh, objects are not part of our galaxy but they are much beyond they are very far away and that is why they are looking so small so they were other galaxies for a long time they the small minority were considered on the wrong track and finally it was decided that yes they were right and uh, you have here what is called the local group of galaxies that is relatively nearby galaxies so they are outside our galaxy but they are nearby astronomer will say look i have got so many stars to play with surely there must be some other stars which will be producing uh, planetary systems which have life 
So uh, that is why an astronomer is considered an optimist in the idea, game of searching for life. So let's go on. Uh, uh, we can say what is the uh, other side of the picture. For that we have to go to biologists who t generally tend to be pessimists in terms of expecting life elsewhere uh, in the universe. So here you see the life as we know it uh, is based on a single uh, <coughs> unit called DNA. It's a collection of molecules arranged in that, uh, what you see this uh, on the slide, like a spiral telescope, a spiral staircase which goes round inside a minaret or something which is circular. So imagine uh, a whole structure of complicated uh, chemical uh, molecules joined in this particular fashion. And that is the starting point of life on the earth. And biologists would say, look, it is so difficult to have arrive at this kind of structure by chance. So there must be uh, a situation that in the whole universe there is no other uh, uh, star which can reproduce this type of life. So this is why biologists are on the negative side, saying don't expect life all that easily. So uh, one could say that there is circumstantial evidence that uh, life could exist elsewhere because the basic building blocks which make up DNA, those basic building blocks are present in space as we just saw just so. But we can also go further and say that just as the sun has several planets, we can ask the question, are there uh, planets around other stars? People did not know the answer to this question till 1991-92, uh, when they began to discover other stars with planetary systems around them. Today, you can easily say that there are more than a thousand planets around other stars, stars other than the sun. So you have, therefore, a situation where there are many stars uh, with sun-like uh, sun planetary systems. Some of them may be exactly like the Earth, in which case uh, you might expect life on them. It is too early yet. But people are discovering new uh, other stars with planets around them. And there is a uh, <coughs> spaceship, space uh, satellite which is Kepler, which is collecting more and more information. And the whole situation is dependent on how many people there are to observe. Because the number of observing opportunities are limited, that is why we are down to uh, thousand only. It might be much more. Uh, we, we never know. So you have a situation that there are stars around other galaxies, uh, stars around, sorry, planets around other stars. So likewise, you can ask this question, if new stars are being born in the galaxy, how many such stars exist, uh, are born per year? And the answer is one new star is born on an average per year. Not very large number, but one. But what you see here are the way stars are born. They're not born one by one but they are born in a group, in a fairly large number. Uh, so for uh, one million years, you might have some stars. The next million years, you may not have. So like that. And here you see a cloud which is uh, containing evidence uh, of new stars. 
and these clouds uh, you can call the uh, <coughs> places where newly born babies exist. So uh, there will be uh, other people who say, you can go on arguing this way or that way, why don't you go and search for life? So how do you search for extraterrestrial life? You might think that a good method would be to have uh, what you see on this slide on the right, an astronaut like the one who went to the moon, uh, taking a spaceship uh, and going along that spaceship, uh, let us say to a nearest star like Alpha Centauri, which is at a distance of 400 quarter light years. That means light takes 400 quarter years to come from Alpha Centauri to us. So if we take that particular uh, star and ask ourselves, supposing we send this uh, astronaut in a spaceship to that star and ask him to find out what is there and come back. Now, uh, is it a feasible uh, method? Let's look at it in the following way. This particular spacecraft, which went to the moon, took about something like uh, 50 hours or two days to go from here to the moon. And if you take the, the fact that <coughs> light takes one and a quarter second to come from the moon to us, that means what light takes one and a quarter second, we take two days. So again, use the same ratio and proportion and ask where light takes four and a quarter years to come to us, uh, how long will the uh, spaceship take to come, go from here to the uh, nearest uh, star? So the answer you will find if you work it out is close to one lakh years. That means this particular person whom you put in the spaceship and send, he ex would expect to travel for one lakh years uh, to go there. Obviously, he's not going to live that long. So what you do is you deep freeze him and put, it, put him in a fridge and send him. Now you can say this is uh, possible. The answer is well, if you do enough research, you will be able to find uh, such a uh, technique so that he goes there uh, after one lakh years, whenever when he reaches that place, your automated method will defreeze him, so he becomes comes back to life. He does the uh, surveying or finding, then freezes himself again and launches the the spaceship is launched back. It's all automated and comes back. This is possible it, if you if you insist. They will. Engineers will make something like that. So what happens, but what happens is that he, he will come back two lakh years after the event. So those people who launched him, like us, uh, we won't be around. So, and when he comes, if somebody in the human life is around, they will not know who is this fellow, why is, how has he come, what is his mandate, so all these things will uh, be uh, undecided. And you see that this method is not going to work, at least for us who want to know whether life exists elsewhere. So we must find some new method. If you send a signal today to Alpha Centauri, the nearest star, you can send a signal, say, like some calling a neighbor uh, on phone, you say, hello, I am speaking from the earth, is anyone out there? And the reply may come, uh, let's see the next slide. The reply may come, hello, greetings from Alpha Centauri, we read you loud and clear. So we, some, we might get the right answer, but we, you need patience because this reply is going to come not immediately as on a phone, but it comes in after eight and a half years. So are you going to keep holding the phone for eight and a half years 
till the reply comes. Obviously not. So what you do is you t dedicate a computer which is hooked to the receiver signal and the, that computer will eventually uh, re report to you, yes, a message has come, you can analyze it, I have recorded it all there. So on that basis people are waiting to see, but it will take 10, 12 years at least uh, for the nearest star. ISRO supported an experiment of a cryo sampler, that is, uh, you, you have a cryogenic high, low temperature collection of gas from the atmosphere and brought down and examined. So imagine you have a payload which is attached to a balloon. Uh, you might see this balloon here. Uh, it is enormous height balloon. Compared to that, you will see the uh, uh, motor car or uh, jeep vehicles at the bottom of the balloon. So you can form some idea of how large it is. So such a balloon will fly up to 41 kilometers. And at any given point, you can allow something to be collected. As you will see, go to the next slide. Next. Uh, here, on the, uh, in the picture on the right and bottom, you see a lot of tubes. These are stainless steel tubes which have been evacuated and sealed and sent up in the payload. So what you do is you issue a command uh, from below uh, for a particular tube to be opened. And there is a pump there, cryo pump, which pumps air at that height into that tube. And then by remote command, you sh uh, shut the tube. So you have collected air from that height and put it in a particular tube. So you keep a record of these, there were 16 tubes, of which 15 were filled up at different heights. One was never opened, I will tell you why. Uh, and then it will be brought down and uh, brought down by parachute. And when it is brought down, uh, then it will be given to biologists to examine what is inside. Now, why we don't, uh, why don't we open one particular window? That is a test of the uh, apparatus. If we have done everything correctly, then that sealed tube, which was never opened, should never contain anything. But if it was yeah, something that was faulty, then there will be leakage. So when that tube is open, we might find some material has leaked into it. So this is a way of distinguishing uh, whether your experiment is scientifically viable or not. So this has been put in, and in all uh, cases we found that uh, this tube is uh, em completely empty. There is no collection inside that sealed tube. Now, when this was done, uh, the first time, we had two labs working on th the data. One was from Cardiff, uh, where Professor Vikrama Singh's colleagues from biology were working. And uh, the other was from CCMB in Hyderabad. So the, the uh, Cardiff group found that certain uh, part, uh, the, w when you collect from a certain tube uh, the air, uh, and that air is allowed to pass through some uh, <coughs> filter, then anything that is bigger than the size of the filter, uh, and the size is such, chosen such, that bacteria will not go through, but will stick on it. So this idea was used, and living cells were collected, and these living cells were given, uh, were painted by uh, cationic dyes, and then they were exposed to UV light, and you see that they shine. Uh, let's look at the next slide. Here also, this is another example. Those two bright spots are shining. 
So these tell us that these pictures, the things are coming from the height we have chosen and they are live cells. This is what biologists tell us. So we are finding live cells at 41 kilometer height. height. Now similar, uh, I, uh, further work was done in Sheffield where uh, the Cardiff group sent part of their sample to Sheffield in UK and Milton Wainwright, uh, who was the biologist who look at, looked at the uh, contents of the uh, amount that what he got. And let's look at the next slide, what he found. So three different types of bacteria familiar to us on the earth uh, were found by him in at 41 kilometers. And the point was that none of these uh, items, uh, they were select, uh, tested by the biological 16S RNA analysis, and they found that it, they, they are similar to certain particular uh, bacterium, uh, and these names are given here, very long names, uh, unlike astronomers who name their objects very simply, biologists seem to choose very long and dif difficult names to remember. Uh, it was clear that there were bacteria collected from 41 kilometer height. They did not come from the lab laboratory by contamination. And people said you should do more tests. Uh, the Hyderabad lab also found a very significant result that these bacteria which they collected was su su uh, bombarded by ultraviolet radiation and they found that that radiation did not kill them. They, the bacteria could survive. Now this doesn't happen for bacteria on the earth. So it is therefore something significant, significantly different about them. Let's go to the next slide. So this experiment was done in, uh, as the first attempt and its success suggested to us that we should do a more precise experiment again. You see it is being taken to the balloon launching site. Let's go to the next. These are the tubes uh, as in the first case. Same collection mechanism was used. Let's go next. And what they found was uh, 12 new bacteria, that, that was much more than previous. And they found, we divided these bacteria into two groups. The, the slightly more, uh, eight cylinders were given to CCMB Hyderabad, and seven cylinders were given to the NCCS, National Center for Cell Sciences in Pune, uh, where biologists examined them also. So you have eight and seven, 15 cylinders. One cylinder was kept closed as a test for correctness of the uh, experiment, as I mentioned before. Now when this was done, all these bacteria, these, that new bacteria which were found, were tested and people found that three of them were completely new to the earth. They had not been seen before. Uh, so finally, the, uh, whenever you discover a new bacterium, you are entitled to give it a name. Just as a discoverer of a new comet can give his name to the comet. So here were three bacteria discovered. So the w one was named after Hoyle. It's called Janibacter Hoyle. Then next, second one was named after Aryabhat, who was the oldest uh, fifth century astronomer, sixth century astronomer called Bacillus Aryabhatae. And the third one was named after our fund, funding agency, ISRO. So Bacillus uh, Isronesis. So these uh, names uh, suggest to you that these are new bacteria, certainly addition. You could still argue that these bacteria are from the earth. Somehow we managed to collect it at 41 kilometer height. And uh, it might be uh, that they were seen for the first time 
on the earth by, by us, but they, they are on, from the earth. Now, how do you convince the skeptic? So this is where we are now planning our next experiment. The, per, per, the uh, method will be such that we will examine a uh, bacterium found in this fashion and uh, put it in a nuclear accelerator machine which will tell you the isotope content, how much carbon-12, how much carbon-13, how much carbon-14 is contained in each bacteria. And we will compare that ratio with what we find for bacteria on the earth. Now, if the bacteria is different, because it's come from somewhere else, then this, uh, what we should find is that uh, the ratios are quite different from what are there for the earth. So we expect and hope that this kind of uh, study will be carried uh, out in the next year or two. And if the answer comes out what we suspect, we are not sure at this stage, as I said. Uh, the whole purpose of the experiment is to have a sure answer. So we would like to have this particular issue resolved and see whether these bacteria are from outside the earth. I think I will stop there and thank you for your patience.